are live. I am delighted to be with Erin Banks today of the Crime Piper blog. She has been following the Scott Peterson case, knows if there's something she knows about this case, uh, doesn't know about this case, I haven't come across it. So, and we're going to be talking today about the evidence against Scott Peterson and the movement to free him. Welcome, Erin Banks. Thank you so much for having me. So you write in your blog. So Aaron wrote this amazing blog debunking Rabia and Ellen, Rabia Chaudhry, who rose to fame advocating for Heyman Lee's killer, Adnan Syed. You wrote this amazing blog debunking Rabia and Ellen Marsh's podcast. And you write in that that this podcast is meaning Robbie and Ellen's podcast is really for the new ears. What do you mean by that? Well, that's what Rabia and Ellen said, right? Um, they drove that point home at the beginning of their podcast, a very poorly researched podcast, I have to say, unfortunately. So they were presenting this case for fresh or new ears. And they were asking people who already knew the case to listen with fresh ears. In other words, uh, they wanted the people to forget the mountains of evidence that convicted Scott. And all of this in favor uh, of their disproven theories on organ harvesters, uh, petty burglars. And I can't actually recall if they mentioned ex-defense attorney Matt Dalton, who got fired, by the way, and his ridiculously absurd satanic cult theory. Um, but they brought all of this in in favor of the actual hard facts, case facts and the evidence. And uh, they hardly brought up to their fresh new ears any of the state's evidence. Or if they did, they did it in passing and mockingly. They disregarded the fact that the bulk of all these pieces of circumstantial and forensic evidence uh, were the reason this man was convicted. It wasn't the media, which Garagos kept poking and prodding to get more attention uh, on that case. Um, it, was, it was Scott. It was his bizarre behavior, his inane lies, and his shockingly stupid way of perpetrating uh, the planning, the execution, and then the aftermath of this double homicide. What do you think the strongest pieces of evidence against Scott Peterson are? Um, that, oh, that is a very good question. Um, there's so much there. Um, I mean, the way I explained this case three years ago, uh, when I first started posting about it, is that you have to look at this case as a cookie. You look at the single ingredients, is butter a cookie? No. Is flour a cookie? Also, no. But you have your dozens and dozens of other ingredients and combined they all make a cookie. So um, in short, and there's much, much more, but the most pressing things that I can think about um, are he predicted his wife's death two weeks before it happened. Team Peterson says um, a dead wife is a common excuse for a married man um, who has an affair. But I'm asking you, you know, how many wives actually turn up dead afterwards? I mean, there's right. probably just a handful. Um, Scott also told different people before and after the morning of the 24th that he went golfing or that he wanted to golf, although he had pre-purchased a fishing pass on which he filled in the date of the 24th. So it wasn't a last minute decision at all. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, this was part of his alibi, a botched alibi. Um, he bought a boat in cash. He didn't register it, uh, at least not under his name. He left it registered to the previous owner, which um, very ironically, his name is also Peterson, Bruce Peterson. There's no relation between the two uh, men though. He told nobody about the boat. He hid the boat in the warehouse. Um, so the boat was always a very crucial piece in uh, how he wanted to execute this crime. Um, the bodies of his wife and son, uh, you know, I don't like how many people always neglect Connor uh, and his murder in this. I mean, he killed two people. Let's just be very clear about it. At eight months, uh, this was 
an almost fully formed baby. And they wash up where Scott went fishing 90 miles from home. And they'd been on the water three and a half months, according to forensics. So that's not suspicious at all. Um, Scott also tried to, and this is one of my favorites, actually. Um, he tried to destroy evidence and went about it in the dumbest way possible. Most people don't think about this stuff, but, uh, you know, they see photos of the boat cover, the leaf blower on top, and they think, yeah, you know, it could have leaked gasoline on top of the boat cover. Maybe he wasn't trying to get the scent of death covered up or uh, for the police dogs uh, to get a hit. But, you know, wait a minute. First of all, <laughs> the leaf blower wasn't leaking. The cap had been screwed off. There's no way you don't notice that. You know, the stench, the wetness, the noise of it splish, splish splashing all across the boat cover when you put it on top of it. So this was very deliberate already. And um, second of all, you just have to look at the photo. Most people don't do that enough. Why was the leaf blower on top of the boat cover? He came home after his so-called fishing trip and stowed the cover in the shed. When was he blowing leaves exactly? His wife was missing, and after washing his clothes, eating and taking a shower, he already calls Sharon telling her that Lacey is missing. So it's important to take note, he didn't ask Sharon, Lacey's mom, uh, if she knew where she was. He said she was missing. So the cavalry is called in, right? Uh, the family is going frantic police arrive. At what time on that or the next day or days would he have had time to blow leaves mm -hmm. for that to be on top of the boat cover? Good People point. overlook these little things and they're all there. Look at the photos, play it through in your head. You have to become the killer to understand the killer. Um, I mean, there's more. There's the fake certificates you ordered. Um, <laughs> Thing. Right. <laughs> I'm laughing because I wasn't familiar with this case. And the one I, per, person I saw who, who did a video on it was uh, on YouTube was Dwyer, uh, who, who was so adamant that Adnan Syed was guilty. So he gave me the impression that this was kind of a thin case. I had no idea. And it's just <laughs> overwhelming when I started going through the court transcripts and the, the the amount of witnesses 175 for the prosecution just an enormous case is there a connection between rabia and mm -hmm. ellen's pro peterson podcast and, and scott peterson's biggest advocate his sister janie peterson i uh, why were you sure janie janie was um right somehow <clears throat> connected uh, with rabia and ellen well, I mean, none of us can be sure. And I said that several people had an inkling or a theory that um, appears to make sense because why else would Janie, who just admitted on her profile to not passing the bar, by the way, log into her Twitter profile that she has not been active on for four months and advertise a podcast she has not yet listened to. I mean, she couldn't reliably know if Raby and Ellen would take a pro or anti-Peterson stance. She only knew Raby was pro Adnan Sayed. So uh, Janie didn't know the specifics of these people and of their podcasts. She conceded she hadn't listened to. Yet all of the appeal page, all of the spa team, all of the pro Peterson people pushed that podcast before it came out saying someone really did their homework here. How would they know though, if they hadn't listened to it? So yes, that is suspicious. And many people who were on the fence uh, on this case, uh, as well as you know our fellow guilty believers uh, wondered because of that, in what way do they know each other? or do these two work with or for Janie? And if you ask that question, which is of course a valid question, the question for many people also became funding and advertisement. So. Mm. Interesting. Um, what do you think, when did this free Scott Peterson movement uh, really gain steam? Mm. And what do you think the uh, movement's appeal is? Uh, 
that's uh, that takes a long answer. I'll try to condense it. So in its earliest stages, um, beginning on message boards years before Facebook existed, it was really just a fringe movement of a handful of conspiracy theorists, basically. So it was perhaps 15, 20 people who each had I don't know, 20, 30 fake profiles on these message boards to go after people um, arguing with the case facts um, to appear like they were a bigger movement than they were. I mean, Google Loretta Dillon and the hate blogs created about her and how they stalked her private life, her family, and threatened and intimidated her. And I'm the Loretta Dillon 2.0, basically. So over the years, it gained um, traction thanks to, of course, how Facebook connects people and how social media nowadays connects people, and sometimes in very unfortunate um, ways. So <clears throat> when we talk about the movement, we have to talk about how um, people to this day and, and I to this day am being impersonated, stalked, cyberbullied, uh, blackmailed. I've had hate groups created about me on Facebook in which private information uh, was shared about me, like my childhood sexual abuse trauma was mocked that they got from my abusive ex who has been stalking me for years. And Rabion, Ellen, and Janie partook in this doxing of me um, publicly by making my maiden name and my given name uh, that I had to change for security reasons public just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So Ellen called me pitiful and pathetic uh, for my autistic special interests. I'm autistic my interest in Peterson and told me that I needed better help therapy and better help has since pulled out of sponsoring them for that. And um, I hope that the other sponsors are going to follow suit. Uh, Cast media has refused to communicate with me about this issue, but I asked them if they would maybe appeal to these two ladies and to Jamie Peterson, if they have any contact with her to take take down these doxing posts and to stop this part of the cyberbullying because they can stop it uh, from, from their end. So we have to remember this is all happening because I'm writing a blog about Peterson with an opinion that they don't share. And this is what they've been doing for 20 years with different people, starting with others like uh, Loretta Dillon. And um, of course, when we talk about the history of this movement, um, you can't not mention the 2017 documentary, um, which was done by close Peterson family friend, Shireen Anderson. Um, Is that the a and &E documentary? <laughs> yeah, that's the a and &E documentary, the, Lacey of, uh, the murder of Lacey Peterson. And um, we saw another dimension of these, these lies about the case uh, and these conspiracy theories that were, were being peddled to, to the public, to the unsuspecting public. And the documentary was a really, came out at a really good time, was perfect timing in that most of the true crime community had totally forgotten about this case or they didn't yet know about it since they were new to true crime. Plus, and this is really important, it was the time that the innocence fraud movement started, which you of course know a little about. So suddenly everyone was innocent, right? People love these underdog stories and ever uh, since, I'm going to word it very carefully. I'm not taking any sides here, but ever since certain political trends started around that time, um, people find it easier to believe that the government is generally shady and they incarcerate innocent people and so on. Um, exactly. And, and they, we say it's an underdog story, but this yeah. is a multi billion dollar movement. And yeah, I say that not just the Innocence Project, the ACLU, the. Yeah. The anti-death penalty, it is enormous. So when people think they're supporting these underdog killers, yeah. they're really supporting the big dog <laughs> and the little exactly. dog. Especially the, in the underdog is the victim. I'm sorry. Especially in this case, because we all know how wealthy the Peterson family is and to what lengths they have gone to well, defend, I guess, their, their family member. But um, it's to me, it's not just a movement. It's in my personal view, it's a cult in its own right. Just because, or just like um, some people consider Alex Jones and his Sandy Hook movement a cult or Charles Manson, Jim Jones drove people to do grotesque 
and unspeakable things. And you can see the same thing happening here, just on a smaller scale. And so far, nobody has died yet in the process. That's good. But, you know, with with um, Peterson, you never know, right? But what they did to you is, is terrible. Is that, That's a violent, they put you in danger. And they knew they were putting you in danger by doxing you, and they didn't care. No. They just no. wanted to scare you and shut you up, which is so ironic to me because they... They start their podcast saying, we just want to present the facts. We're just all about the facts and the truth. <laughs> and do your own research. And they suggest people Google it, but they never say Googling it. It was just very interesting when I was looking to research on YouTube, just looking for documentaries and stuff. That A&E docu documentary is the first thing that comes up on YouTube. And they push yeah. that thing. You can't get away from it, is what I'm saying. It's exactly. like, oh, not the A and E documentary again. Again, they tell again. you they tell you to Google it and to YouTube it because, of course, how Google SEO works, and there's probably some, you know, money involved there and so forth. Um, it comes up on top of the search results. People are not going to go to page two, three, four, wherever they find my blog or anyone else and s look through all of these results. They just want a quick condensed version of the case, right? Um, so Googling is not going to be your friend in this case. I mean, you have to really read through the, the trial transcripts yourself or go to blogs that uh, offer some insight really based on the actual facts of the case. So, so how do we know, let's get into some of the evidence. How hmm. do we know that Scott left at, at 10.08 in the morning on the right. morning of the 24th? <laughs> Well, I mean, my team got that time from the appeal website. They had listed that as a featured fact. They have these little featured facts on their page, which uh, since then has disappeared, um, like so many of their featured facts do when they change their narrative again. So um, the 1008 timeline is forensic evidence because law enforcement did three cell tower tests and it can't be disputed that that is the time Scott departed the driveway of his home, not as he claimed and religiously repeated at 9.30 a.m. He even said so and repeated it several times on the Gloria Gomez interview, and I think Diane Sawyer too, um, that he left at 9.30, 9.30, 9.30. And it's not as Janie claimed on Dr. Phil a little closer to 10 a.m., the time and the timeline of that morning and everything that happened is almost all clear. So <clears throat> what plays into this whole 1008 AM lie is the what I call the activity lies. So according to Scott, Lacey was curling her hair, mopping, and taking a walk. First, Lacey was mopping at 8 AM, and then suddenly she was mopping when Scott left at 1008. Um, She's a mopping maniac, according to Scott. And she did all of that before baking and cooking. And less than a day after the maid had cleaned the whole house. But at the same blog, 22 hours, 22 hours. She was yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but at the same time she was doing that, um, that she was allegedly mopping, she was also walking in La Loma Park according to Team Scott, and curling her hair. Let's not forget that. So Scott and his team just keep getting caught in these lies. And every time, like, instead of just accepting reality and giving up, uh, they create a new one, tormenting uh, the Rochas or the Rochas in the process. And that's what I'm actually really sorry about. So what do you... Um... Robbie and Ellen retell this story of the, you, you just mentioned, of, of Lacey curling her hair and looking so cute. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you doubt that is the, the last sighting? The, the curling the hair thing? Mm -hmm. um, well, huh, there's so much uh, playing, playing into this. I mean, first of all, Scott uh, tells everyone he never said that to Sharon, Lacey's mom. Um, and of course, in her book, Sharon goes into detail about Skip. Scott telling her how cute Lacey looked curling her hair the last time he saw her uh, the morning of the 24th. But there's a few issues there. And that starts with um, 
with what I already addressed, Lacey doing three things at once, mm -hmm. but also he told police a different story, not that she was curling her hair when he left. He always kept changing his story around. Another thing is that if Lacey was sat on the bench to do her hair the way Amy, her sister, had shown her, she couldn't see herself in the bathroom mirror because it was far too high up. This is a photo and the so-called home series that the appeal f <laughs> the appeal Facebook page does not show you, and for good reason. They have plenty of photos, but the crucial ones disputing all of their narrative are always missing. There's plenty of photos uh, like that. So we don't know when Lacey actually did her hair, if it was uh, on the evening of the 23rd after um, Amy had shown her how to do it. Was she practicing, you know, for the next day? And that was why she left the curling iron uh, there and it was still in the bathroom because uh, there was no need to put it back because she, she uh, would use it again several hours later. But here again, you have to think it through. So um, Lacey curls her hair before her misty morning walk that would frizz up her hair, wind blowing. <laughs> She'd do it before cooking and baking, sweating, not just because she's pregnant, but because of hot steam blowing in her face from the oven and obliterating her curls or whatever she was going to do with her hair. Really? Really? Let's listen to that. You put up a great clip on your YouTube channel. Let's just play it real quickly. This yeah. is Sh Sharon Rocha uh, talking in her book uh, about what Scott told her about the last time he saw Lacey. Do you know what you told me that she was doing when I asked you this before? Do you remember telling me that? She was mopping the floor. No. You told me she was sitting on her little bench in front of the mirror, and she looked so cute because she was styling her hair like Amy had styled it for her the night before. Do you remember telling me that? No. I don't remember telling you that. Hmm. That's too bad you don't remember that, because I talked, why are you asking me these questions? Now he was angry. <clears throat> There's Scott caught in another lie. And that's, <laughs> I just love what the lead detective says. You just can't be that good. As good as you <laughs> think you're going to be committing the perfect, perfect murder. You're just never as good. There's also a gift basket that uh, for Lacey's right. grandfather was never picked up. Why is that significant? And why do you think Robbie and Ellen left it out of their podcast? Well, I mean, the gift basket is just another little piece um, that plays into Scott's general deceptiveness, right? And the many lies he told everybody, his, his family, the neighbors, friends, law enforcement, what have you. Um, so he didn't just lie to and about Amber, like Team Peterson says. He lied about everything. So with the gift basket, Scott was at Lacey's sister Amy's hair salon, um, she had a very quaint name, Salon Salon, um, to get his hair cut. And Amy mentioned that they bought, bought a gift basket at Bella Farms for um, their granddad that needed picking up. And Scott immediately volunteered, saying that he was, drum roll, golfing there tomorrow anyway. That was very clever because he already gave his original alibi to someone, right? The golfing in lieu of the fishing that he later on uh, settled on. So <laughs> the next day, uh, after his 180 mile round trip, for which he had purchased a fishing license four days prior, so he never intended to go golfing. He calls Lacey on the way back home um, to say he didn't have time to pick up the gift basket, asking her to do it. So this was another piece of his alibi, calling Lacey to make it appear he didn't know she was missing. I mean, at that time she was dead. He killed her. But that's just on a side note. So um, at the same time, Amy called him because Vela Farms had informed her um, they're closing their gates and, oh, hey, you know, the gift basket is still here. What happened? And Scott doesn't pick up her call. He picks up everybody else's call, just not Amy's. 
So <laughs> it started out kind of clever, but basically turned into a little bit of a dumb alibi too, because um, the thing with Vela Farms is that it's 40 minutes round trip from uh, Lacey and Scott's home. So Scott called her too late. Lacey would have had to drop everything, probably her mop, since she was a mopping maniac, stop baking, stop cooking, race out the door before Vela Farms closed. And so, of course, when he came home, you know, there was no gift basket on the counter. Lacey's car's there. The house is dark, nothing baking and cooking, but he goes and has some pizza and milk. And he didn't wonder, my wife's eight months pregnant. Is she okay? I better immediately make some calls. Uh, and T. Peterson always argues that um, Scott thought Lacey's mom had picked up Lacey in the gift basket. And it's like, wait a minute. Think this through, though. The woman who'd been divorced from Dennis since the 70s would pick up a gift basket for his, Dennis' father, and take it to her place. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think it through. He didn't think it through. Yeah. Why, why did, um, is Amber Fry insignificant? I mean, to uh, this story. I mean, right. Amber Fry. Um, yes and no, right? Because... It's entirely insignificant that Scott had this extramarital affair with her, okay? The guilty side, uh, the prosecution, the jury never cared about his philandering with Amber. First of all, Amber didn't know he was married. And even if she had, that's a private matter, not a criminal one. So this isn't the medieval ages, right? Um, Scott, having lied in order to facilitate this um, relationship um paints paints a different picture because he was a uh, habitual philanderer he was habitually cheating and had done ever since he had relationships <laughs> and uh, we see in that of course re reflected that he he was generally a very practiced liar and that he lied to everyone around him and that he also had a, a very easy timeline to to Lacey, his family law enforcement and so forth um, but what makes Amber actually um, important or significant and what, what aided in convicting Scott to a major degree is, is two things. Um, first of all, I already mentioned this, stating two weeks before Lacey went missing that this would be his first Christmas without his wife whom he had lost. He tried to qualify that later by saying, Oh, Amber, there are different types of loss. <laughs> and that Lacey was alive in Modesto. I, what? H how would he know that? If he knows she's alive in Modesto, why isn't he telling the police, the media, his parents, the whole neighborhood? I would have shouted it from the rooftops. Yahoo! My wife's alive. So he's being looked at by police, right? Along with a whole bunch of other people. And is keeping her parents in suspense. We're freaking out at this point. He's wasting taxpayer money for, you know, they had divers. Okay, you know how much that costs? And knows Lacey is alive in Modesto. Um, why is he moving the search efforts hours south of Modesto, where she's supposedly alive, to San Francisco, opening volunteer centers, wasting people's time, playing with their emotions? So all of that is complete nonsense okay he was placating amber and um of course by that time she knew something wasn't right uh, and which is why she worked with police although she was terrified and people don't talk about this this fact enough that she had a young daughter and she had to record this man who appear, appeared um to have made his wife disappear that is terrifying she is a very very brave and commendable woman that she did that and um that's through... a great point people don't see her yeah. like that i think no. that she's seen as half an attention seeker um yeah and she wasn't and she half was a sort of an unfortunate story. celebrity I, I would think maybe yeah. i'm wrong on that but that's that's my no opinion. exactly my she's an exactly she never asked for that i mean there's people who plastered her um slightly naughty pictures on tv she didn't ask for that see she, she'd signed away those rights not thinking about that this could happen to her she'd she'd be involved in a murder case 
and she could have made so much money talking about this case and writing books and going on interviews and doing whatnot, and she was very respectful. But what's most important to remember about Amber is also that when Scott made the decision to flee, um, and law enforcement luckily intercepted him, he appears to have been on his way to Amber's. He had a map of Amber's workplace printed out. He had a shovel, robe, and gloves with him, and I don't recall what else, but she was a witness, you know, and probably the most crucial one. So he wouldn't have stopped at two murders, very likely. That's a great point. What You mentioned Scott Peterson's family being wealthy. I had no idea that they were so yeah. wealthy. What do we know about Scott Peterson's family? Well, I mean, <laughs> we know that they're a mostly wealthy family, or I think they uh, refer to themselves as um, upper middle class from San Diego. And I know their occupations, you know, Lee, his dad was a truck driver who um, became a shipping or crating business owner extraordinaire. And it's a family business by, by now and so forth. Um, and of course, we know about Janie, Scott's sister-in-law, who was married to Joe, uh, one of Scott's brothers. And interestingly, she is the family spokesperson. Um, she fights for Scott in public, whereas the rest of the family is surprisingly quiet, especially after uh, Scott's mother, Jackie's death. Um, I don't actually talk so much about uh, the family other than in context of this case, um, because that's what the pro Scott Brig brigade do, right? They dig into people's private lives and fling mud that they created out of things that weren't actually sinister, uh, but are just personal. And mm -hmm. I mean, we know a couple of things about Jackie and I know I, I don't actually take well to the fact that it's sometimes brought up by guilty people that she gave two of her kids away. That's public knowledge. Um, I think that's her private and personal decision, and I'd like for stuff like that to stop in the guilty camp. There's not many people doing that at all, but I just think it's it's good to not cross certain boundaries and not act like, you know, Team Scott is doing. <laughs> so that's, um, that's very fair. Um, what we know about the Peterson family and their... Did they aid him in when he was, was Scott Peterson trying to flee to Mexico and did the family aid him in that potential <sighs> fleeing? Well, <laughs> I have to be really careful here, right? But it, it certainly appears that way. Um, I did a whole blog post on this issue um, with all of the items. I mean, it was a very long list I typed out. Um, that he had with him. I mean, first of all, he had the cash from his parents or from his mom. And then there was something about, oh, that was just an actual accidental withdrawing. And um, that wasn't actually my money. And then he bought the car in Jackie's name. And he said, it's like a, a boy named Sue kind of thing that he was Jackie Peterson, Jacqueline Peterson. And that's just ridiculous. So it appears that maybe the family knew a little more than what they publicly can say. Um, I may be wrong about that, but with all of the stuff in his possession and the fact that, um, you know, why didn't his brothers, uh, I think it was Joe and John, drive his, his truck, right? They said, oh, we just did that because uh, he was under media scrutiny. But wait a minute, when did that happen? That happened from like March to, to mid-April. Uh, Really, I, I dare everyone to go online, find me one single thing that came out on Peterson during that time frame. Nobody cared about that case. That started up again when the bodies washed ashore. So this was to throw up uh, of law enforcement, not the media, because it points to maybe they knew he was trying to flee. Maybe not. I could be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, she testified for the defense, and you can read her testimony. I, you know, that website, the pre Scott Peterson people put up yeah. the so kudos to them for putting up the trial transcripts. But what what they did is they made a summation uh, of the testimony, 
-hmm. And I really got a kick out of reading those summations <laughs> of the testimony and then reading the testimony because yeah, it, to me, it appeared to be a, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. So <laughs> whatever there was any kind of slight sort of doubt, that's what the whole testimony became about. And the really important things that the witness said were just sort of like, you know, not mentioned. It, it, no, it, exactly. So I no, think they do this a lot. They cut off testimonies. They post their little snippets and quotes. And it's like it, it cuts off whenever it disputes their narrative, basically. And that's why people have been saying that they weaponize the discovery. Right. They they weaponize um, the access that they have because they have the money to get their hands on many of these files uh, and they're abusing that. They're not giving us the full scope and letting us decide, OK, do we actually buy this stuff? Mm. So what do we know about all these witnesses who said they saw Lacey that morning? There's so mm. many witnesses. Obviously, I played the the terrible, I, I thought it was a disastrous interview with Dr. Phil, which is ironic because Dr. Phil <laughs> pushes innocence fraud so often on his channel. Yeah. I thought he'd go in on this, but this is, this is apparently Scott, the free Scott Peterson movement <laughs> is just a step too far, even for Dr. Phil. What I do mean, we know about we, all these witnesses? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's I all mean, I mean, <laughs> What we know about the the all of these witnesses is that the numbers constantly change, right? I mean, <laughs> you started out with I think fourteen, then it was eleven, then three, then it was I don't know thirty, three hundred. I really have no clue anymore at this point because it always changes. <laughs> and when you actually ask, but here's a screenshot. You have this as a featured fact. You have this on your website. Where did that go? you know, they'll mute you, they'll block you, they'll just ignore it, they'll take it down, or they'll they'll uh, do very complicated math things, such as, um, well, it was three, and three plus 11 makes 14. So <laughs> for that information, uh, that still doesn't answer the question, but okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, in short. <laughs> um, Isn't it just like a kaleidoscope? That's what I agree I, I, I with. <laughs> It's like they take little pieces and then they make a new case out of the little yeah. pieces they like instead of looking <laughs> at all the evidence. They do. And, you know, my favorite, I have to just really quickly, because I know you want to move on probably, but my, my favorite ones are Martha and Frank. Um, mm. And I found something really, really crucial just a little while ago. So I'm going to go into this real quick. Um, Martha's husband, Frank, drove the car on the 24th, right, when they passed a woman at 9.45, allegedly, that Martha reliably, according to her, identified as Lacey. So she even said she saw her sunflower tattoo on the side of her ankle, which is interesting for two reasons. A, it was a moving car. And B, the way Martha described it was that Lacey would have been uh, walking uh, towards them. So how did they see the ankle tattoo that was on the side? That already doesn't make sense. So Martha's statement also seemed to back up um, another walking witness. Um, his name is Jean Pedrioli, and it turns out that he was at his mom's retirement home at the time. So he couldn't have seen Lacey or anyone because he wasn't there. Okay, so <laughs> where Lacey was allegedly walking. And um, one of the defense investigators um, who talked to, to Martha his name was uh, Ermoyan, Mr. Er Ermoyan. Um, after forensic de forensics determined, without the shadow of a doubt, Scott had not left at 9.30, um, but at 10.08 a.m., Martha suddenly said she saw Lacey between 10.30 and 10.45 a.m. Isn't that interesting? So here's the real kicker, though. As if that wasn't bad enough, fast forward to Martha dying and not making fun of that by the way um but she died and that's when frank had to uh relay her eyewitness statement um and then suddenly the time changed yet again he changed it to between 9 30 and 11 a.m i mean that, that's all a big difference from the that's original a big, that's a big span right? 9 30 and 11 right mm -hmm. 
And um, also in the, the, I call it the crockumentary or the mockumentary, the murder of, murder of Lacey Peterson. Um, that was done by, again, close family friend Shireen Anderson. Uh, Frank says on camera, on the documentary, that Lacey was walking towards them. So <laughs> before his wife died, they claimed she was walking away from them. Um, so she's walking in the opposite direction that Jean Pedrioli and uh, another one, I think Vivian Mitchell, had her walk in. Really? I mean, go to the blog and read through Exhibit 13 that I found, um, where you can see what, what Frank actually said. But um, there's another problem with, with Martha and why uh, Team Peterson is so obsessed with especially her eyewitness testimony. And that's because they say Martha allegedly knew Lacey. And that's why she's so credible. But the thing is, first of all, they didn't know each other. Okay, they had the same physician. That's a huge difference. How often um, does a, a healthy young woman go to the doctor I have no idea, once a year for a physical maybe. And why would she go now uh, that she was having a baby? So for these entire eight months, she probably went to an OBGYN in those, uh, during that time. Um, so how often did Martha go to the doctor for her to have recognized the woman from the waiting room? Was she there every single time Lacey was? And that's a bit of a coincidence. It, that is, and let's play, um... You call it one of the 274 false eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. and um, this is one who who knew, who said he knew Lacey. Now, right. another yet unconfirmed lead is in a uh, sporting goods store in Modesto. An employee from the sporting goods store went to high school with Lacey and recognized her when she walked into the store. There's still no word on whether she was in that store or not. The employee claims he saw her on Christmas Eve between 10 30 and 2. Mm -hmm. so she was also in a sporting sporting good store yeah it's just kind of like um, she was a busy lady that morning <laughs> very 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 busy um also one of these witnesses was was coerced no yeah um, to change her story can you talk a little bit about that well, that was um, Diana Campos, and um, she had been coerced by, again, um, Mr. Armoyan, who was a defense investigator. And um, it, she had originally given um, her time at that she saw Lacey at 1045, I think. If I'm wrong, it was probably 1040 to 50 ish, but that's about the, the time she said. And then later, um, she was contacted by Ermoyan, who keeps telling her and pressing her that she has the wrong time. She needs to change it. She needs to remember the right time. It was this and that time. And she's getting confused, right? She's she's afraid. I mean, this is a person of authority, um, an authority figure. She might have accidentally lied. Oh, my goodness. So she complied and she changed the time to 940 a.m. because she was coerced, because that fit. With the timeline, the defense's faulty narrative back then um, went went on. Um, but ultimately, she checked her stamp card from her work uh, back then and saw that she'd been correct about her original time estimate. That still doesn't mean she actually saw Lacey. But what this does is it just showcases how the defense works and how sleazy uh, and dishonest, they appear to work at times, some say. And frankly, uh, in this instance with Armoyan, it, it does almost sound a little criminal, some say, right? Coercing a witness is no laughing matter here. Absolutely not. And one of the big talking points for Scott Peters, Team Scott Peterson, is that it would be impossible for Scott to load Lacey's body in broad <laughs> daylight without anyone right. no noticing. How well, I mean, it appears that he anticipated he wouldn't be able to do this without being seen. And of course, you know, you have uh, Kristen Dempelwolf uh, who saw him and also stated this to police. So that's where the concealment comes in of the body, of Lacey and Connor's body. Um, because he tried to load the three seven-foot 
Ellen said they were 11 feet. That's incorrect. Uh, patio umbrellas onto his truck, um, which Dimple Wolf saw. And it appears that maybe hidden inside of them, hidden underneath the other two he piled on there, may have been Lacey's body wrapped in the tarp and all of it held together in place, her being held in place um, also with the missing chicken wire. Um, the chicken wire was likely also used for the anchors that he tied to her extremities, so she would sink down into the bay, just as he had stated to a friend years prior about how he'd make a body disappear. You know, it's just a totally normal, lighthearted conversation between friends about how to murder people. Um, nothing to see. And before anyone says that, you know, that's what I do. I do this for my novels. So that's, that's my job. And no one's ever ended up dead around me either. That <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyway, uh, for, for everyone saying he could have never loaded her body in broad daylight without anyone seeing it, I encourage you all to watch Chris Watts' neighbor surveillance video uh, again, he did it at night, uh, but there was uh, a light source and he was filmed. Um, you cannot tell it was a body. You can just tell it was a large item. Um, and in Scott's case, seven foot patio umbrellas were ideal to cover Lacey's body. So um, Scott drove to the warehouse, which is private. He was alone on the premises. So he had ample time and the privacy to transfer the body from the truck to the boat then and there, hypothetically, right? So um, note how the umbrellas were fine to have in the backyard. And these are patio outdoor umbrellas, but suddenly he wanted to keep them safe from the aggressive Modesto winter driving <laughs> 180 miles round trip back and forth <laughs> and forgetting to unload them at the warehouse twice that day and instead of leaving them on the truck for the next time he goes to the warehouse probably a day or so after christmas right he puts them back on their property in the backyard all right if you're just tuning in i'm talking to aaron banks of the crime piper blog and we're discussing scott peterson the evidence against him and the movement to free him uh please hit the like button subscribe um and let's move on. Uh, you talk mm -hmm. about, you compare that, that loading of Lacey's body in his truck to Chris Watts yeah. and um, the loading of his children and his wife. Right. Why do you think that that was a good comparison? Well, because, I mean, with Chris Watts, I, I said it was the middle of the night. Actually, it was 5 a.m. I mean, to me, that's in the middle of the night because I'm a writer. I get up at like 2 p.m., right? But <laughs> I mean, it was definitely dark outside. Um, but it, it's the same thing. I mean, um, it, he was he was filmed. I mean, that, that's pretty much as, as good as anything. And I think you even, as far as I recall, it's been a couple of weeks I, I last watched that um, video, the Chris Watts video. But um, as far as I recall, there were headlights in the distance. So there was actually uh, cars driving by here and there. I don't know, early workers, late night parties. I have no idea. But um, I think I recall there was at least one uh, car driving by. And of course, he may have very likely known because of, you know, the, the neighborhood he was living in, that his neighbors had um, a camera, you know, an outdoor camera to keep safe. I mean, they, they had a very uh, expensive home and in a very expensive neighborhood, basically. So he, he didn't care about that. He knew what he was doing. He just, he had his alibi, he had his excuse. That's it. That's a great point. I'd love that you wrote, you wrote, <laughs> they say Chris Watts agrees. You wrote, it just made me laugh. You're like, they say he couldn't load the body. You know, they say he loaded the body in daylight. Chris Watts agrees that you could do it, you know, yeah. <laughs> because they're just the way he backed in the truck. It's just very reminiscent of, of Chris Watts, certainly. Uh, what, um, how long was the, you talk about this like incredibly short fishing trip that he took. So he drives like this incredibly long, uh, long distance hmm. out of the way to go sturgeon fishing, which you point out sturgeons are enormous. 
how enormous do you know by chance how enormous sturgeons are i mean are we talking are they well like, i mean aren't they like they, they can all i can imagine I mean, are the things people hang on their wall that's what i'm imagining those giant are they giant yeah i mean they're the ones that you have you know that you hang on the walls they're not that big um but <laughs> for, for size um i don't i'd actually have to look up how big they get um okay. they're in that area tiny, but though. they can weigh they can weigh up to 800 pounds right um like <laughs> atlantic Strathern, it can get 16 feet long basically I and mean, there, there's there's definitely much much smaller ones right uh two to three i, I have to convert from meter seven seven to ten feet basically but i mean it was a 14 feet boat it was a dinghy let's look at the boat <laughs> Sorry, let me let me take a moment to compose myself while we look at the boat. Let's right, look at Scott Peterson's fantastic, uh, um, fantastic demonstration of this is his defense demonstration of that he could not have. I love that meant one. to show that Scott Peterson could not have dumped Lacey and Connor's bodies over body over the. Thing because it's just too difficult. Let me let me let me control myself. Yeah. Release your weight. Okay. <laughs> then it goes into another. But you can see him tipping himself up, like not quite, not quite, not quite. And he's like, I mean, the demonstrator is like pushing the know. whole thing and it's still not going until he finally is <laughs> parallel to the water. Does the boat tip over? No? It's ridiculous. I mean, you have to know that, um, first of all, <laughs> That was Rafi, right? He was um, Garagos paralegal at the time. He was uh, a very short man. Um, Peter's in six feet. And obviously, this was a tiny little man. It was like Danny DeVito's twin that had to be weighted down to even come close to the weight of Scott Peterson, who was a little chubbier at the time. And um, <laughs> It's just, you, you can tell. I mean, just like you say, you can tell he's, he's desperately trying to tip over the boat. And he's so almost great. drowning. He has all these weights strapped to him, so he would kind of come close. Um, I think it was like 20, uh, 20 pounds, you know, a, a weight belt of 20 pounds that they strapped to him. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. just, it's just amazing. And I've been in, I've watched, uh, Scott Garagos in, in court, and boy, is he slick. He was the lawyer for Claire Bronfman in the next <laughs> yeah. year for a minute and a half. She switched lawyers all the time. But I mean, the, the fact that he's saying that this is some, that he didn't have uh, good counsel or, or this was some, it's just so ridiculous. But they, they try everything. One of the things um, that Robbie and Ellen bring up is this mm -hmm. van sighting. Can oh boy! Talk, what is what is that van? Can you describe what that van, yeah. what they say that sighting was? And right, that's and, the Harshman tip that you're referring to. You. Or at least I think you are. So yes, thank Tom you, Harshman. Um, while out driving in his car, spotted a lady leaning against or squatting down um, to take a, fee, a pee at a fence. Right. Um, 
And he says there was a guy shielding her, hovering over her. I mean, first of all, that's not nefarious, okay? There was a pregnant or a slightly overweight woman peeing, and a guy she was with guarding her from, from view, very ironically, from people like Harshman watching people pee in public for some reason that only he knows the answer to, right? Uh, maybe that's the thing. I don't know. But um, then Harshman said he saw someone pulling her back into the van again. Um, so someone helping her up into the van, being pregnant or overweight points to an abduction, really, or this having been lacy. And you saw all of this while speeding by at 40 miles an hour. You didn't race after that car to save that lady's life or note down the license plate and call the police. Um, you also have to take two other things into account with the whole Harshman debacle. First of all, the burglars didn't have a van, okay? They didn't even have a car. Stephen Todd hauled items out of the Medina home that was burglarized on the 26th. Not the 24th, not the 25th, as Tim, Team Peterson sometimes states. Um, they had to get the burglar's mommy's little Honda to try and get the safe. They didn't have a car. The only van parked out on the street was the Peterson's neighbor, Amy Crickbombs. It was a white van with green lettering. So any witnesses saying that the burglary happened on the 24th because they saw a van there, they're mistaken. They should have seen two vans in that case. And of course, you know, the insurance claim agent who investigated the case noted down black and white, the burglary happened on the 26th. Now, um, if you know a little bit about insurance agents, you know that they definitely don't get it wrong. Okay, they're trying to get out of paying, they're trying everything in their power to nail down the times, the people and the circumstances. And the police investigated and corroborated it. The burglars passed their polygraphs. Uh, so that's just a couple of more unchangeable and unalterable facts. And the second thing about Harshman is the timeline. So the burglary, they say, happened on the 24th at 1140 a.m. But Harshman saw the pee lady in the afternoon. And I think, um, I think he said it was like two, between two and four. So you have these two burglars driving around Modesto in a van they somehow must have gotten after ditching mommy's Honda, just letting their victim enjoy the scenery and letting her pee against fences in broad daylight so everyone can see her. Um, why would you do, I mean, why would you do that if you were kidnapped? I mean, why would you do that? Why do you because drive a walk sense. for hours and hours with, with a victim in your car? It doesn't make any sense. So, um, it's, it's like the Truman Show. I don't know if anyone remembers that. I'm pretty old. So, <laughs> Me too. Me too. The people keep walking around the block and Truman realizes, Jim Carrey, wait a minute, that's the same lady. She always keeps circling the block on her little bike. That's basically what they're seeing happen here with the Harshman tip. That's so, you know, this is what the thing that I find so hard to wrap my head around is this Modesto or Medina burglary mm -hmm. and they're used, seems to be used interchangeably. Why would someone burgle a house and kidnap someone? It's, yeah. a, it's a crime that, that we don't often see together. I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> am I forgetting some kind of famous no, it's, burglary it's and, 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 um, this kind of thing of a pregnant woman. I mean, the pregnant right. woman is the last person you'd want to kidnap. Exactly. There's so many needs. There's so many people looking for them. And around Christmas time, you're going to, I mean, talk about alerting authorities, but criminals no, aren't exactly. always smart. I mean, this kind of goes, this kind of goes into the Aponte tip a little bit. Um, what is the Aponte tip? Right. Oh. <laughs> So about um, three and a half weeks after Scott's arrest, um, Lieutenant uh, Xavier Aponte came into view, right? And he was like, okay, I have exonerating um, evidence. Um, just to, to make that clear, that was when he came forth was the time when the reward money jumped from, I think it was 10K to 500K. So the story goes that Ponty, who worked at a men's prison, I think it was Norco, um, 
yeah, uh, said that he overheard the phone conversation between inmate um, Sean Tenbrink and his brother Annan that someone told him burglar Stephen Todd approached Lacey, um, uh, th that Lacey ap approached the burglars uh, during the burglary when that was in process. And of course, that that person, that mystery person, that someone was never located because they don't exist. So um, Aponte said there's a recording of that conversation, but Surprise, surprise, the tape was lost. It gets better, though, because there was a spiral notebook where all calls to and from uh, the prison were logged, and that notebook mysteriously disappeared, too. So after all of that already happened, Aponte also lost something else, and that was his memory. Um, did anyone interview Sean Tenbrink about this? Who was it? Did he mail the tape out to someone, and who and when did that happen? No clue. When he called the Modesto Police Department to share his knowledge, whom did he talk to? Can't recall. Uh, and last but not least, he refused to testify in court. So there's that. Mm. I, I think I think the the final one to me is uh, very uh, damning. <laughs> yeah, someone who doesn't want to face cross examination or or even to to get to to give that testimony under oath is yeah, very, it's... lifts my eyebrow. Very suspicious. Now, why was Scott Peterson's death sentence overturned? Right. Um, well, having a million dollar celebrity attorney, uh, there were loopholes that were exploited, right? Um, out of the many, many jurors that were interviewed um, to be sat on the jury, 13 apparently weren't asked if they could suspend their belief uh, against the death penalty or uh, whether they would be okay with sentencing Peterson to die, basically. Um, so because this is a necessity to be on a jury and guarantee the correct procedure and the fairness of a trial, Garagos, who had dug through all of these jury questionnaires to find something to overturn the death sentence, rolled with that. So the death sentence was overturned on a technicality. Um, I mean, California has a, a moratorium on the death sentence anyway. No one's been put to death in I don't even know how long. Uh, it's just not happening. So it, it was ludicrous. It was uh, a waste of taxpayer money. It was more torment for the Rochas. Um, but that's just how the defense team rolls. And um, some say there are bloodhounds who enjoy the blood, right? I don't know. What's so interesting is that Robbie and Ellen make it seem like it this was so unfair. The trial was so unfair to Scott because of it. You get three different things. One, the cops wanted already, even before the trial, mm -hmm. invited the media in and made it a media circus. Number two, Nancy Grace, just mm -hmm. Nancy existing and reporting the way she does made it unfair for Scott. And the, Third thing was the pitchforky mob. That's the only way I can describe it. Meaning the media riled up the general public so much to Scott's guilt that well, how would that even trial. matter? The, how would that even matter? The general public isn't sitting in the courtroom. That's the jurors. And they were kept away from all of this stuff. Right. right. So whatever the public thinks or doesn't think isn't even that interesting. And as for Nancy Grace, Nancy Grace does what Nancy Grace does. OK, you can like it or hate it, but it doesn't actually matter because Garagos was the one pushing for this to happen. And he did, did it, it appears that maybe he did it very deliberately just because he knew, oh, damn, this isn't a case I can win, <laughs> right? So I right. need something to go on for later for the appeals right. process. But wasn't there a juror who got dismissed who came out, like, uh -huh. he came out gunning for Scott Peterson's innocence out of that courtroom. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, you're remembering that correctly. And of course he's, he's a, a fan favorite, you know, of team Peterson. <laughs> but how did that happen? Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? If it was so stacked against Scott, how did one juror, how did one juror come out of that, that courthouse? Like, 
basically yeah. like a, a, a fan. I mean, there was a lot of that. There was there was quite quite a little bit of, of um, ups and downs with the different jurors. And I know that Justin Falconer is, of course, a very regular guest in all of these pro-Scott groups. But he appeared to, from the get-go, um, be convinced of Peterson's innocence. And he also, he admitted, I think it was on the A&E documentary, um, I might be wrong, but he admitted on camera that he went home and Googled the case. Like, what? <laughs> I just... You can't do that. That's the whole point. You're you're supposed. It's not to... like he didn't. They remind you every yeah. time you leave, even for a break, for a five second break. They remind the jurors uh, yeah. of 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 that of those kind of things. So that's absolutely absurd. Um, do you think Scott Scott's conviction will be overturned? Do you think he'll get a new trial, Aaron? <sighs> I mean, I'm not a lawyer or legal analyst, right? I'm just a little writer who spent thousands of hours and years on this case. But um, even with that, it's difficult to tell. I mean, it shouldn't happen because um, we laid out very clearly on the blog as to why. And, um, you know, as you know, you can lie in the habeas, which is exactly what happened. You can say the sky is green, which is what the defense did because they stated that Rochelle niece, uh, one of the jurors, lied on the jury questionnaire. And Rochelle didn't lie. She made mistakes on her jury questionnaire because she's a regular person with no legal background. And that's why she didn't know that having filed a restraining order against her ex Eddie Whitehead, um, his ex-girlfriend, Marcella Kinsey, was considered a lawsuit. I wouldn't have known that. that I, that's I wouldn't have either. And, no. I do, and uh, we're, we're looking at cases all the time. This is his, this is her ex, this was something, her ex-boyfriend's ex-girlfriend, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, at the time, Eddie was her boyfriend, and that was his ex-girlfriend who did not uh, attack um, Rochelle me. She wasn't a victim of, of any violence, um, also not of any domestic violence further down the road. What Marcella did is she kicked Eddie's front door and a tire of his car. So that's not an assault on Rochelle unless she's a door and a car tire. It's ludicrous, right? right. <laughs> Jenny Peterson runs with these lies and the media runs with it because ever since the the mockumentary, the crockumentary, she sells it as gospel. And um, thanks to also thanks to A&E's almost criminal negligence to do their due diligence and fact check the, the spot team so-called research. So um, I, it's I, outrageous. I, I see I how it goes, but if, if the judge will keep all of this in mind, and I mean, there was the evidentiary hearing and so forth. She heard all of what Rochelle Nees had to say. So we'll see how it goes, but it's, it's pretty obvious that, um, Rochelle wasn't a stealth juror. She couldn't have been because she was only an alternate juror anyway. And there was always the issue of 97A, which I've been, you know, insisting on people research that for, for years and years because she, what, she was asked. What is, on the question, what is 97A? Right. 97A was a question on, on the jury uh, questionnaire. And she was asked if she could be, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is just too hilarious. If she could be impartial about the case. And she said no, because she didn't understand the question correctly. The way it was worded it was very confusing. I read the, the jury questionnaire, some of the questions, and I also I was it's it's legalese. You just don't get that. So that's quite a stealth juror right there who says, no, I can't be impartial. And oh, by the way, I'm just uh, an alternate juror anyway. She couldn't know that she would end up uh, on the jury. In fact, she wanted to be excused because she said she wouldn't get paid for that time. And it was Garagos who called her back and said, wait a minute, can we get some financial aids and so forth? He wanted her on this jury, or at least as an alternate juror. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, does anybody have any questions um, for Aaron or myself? I just think it's very interesting. You know, you brought up in your blog how they, now I'm forgetting her last name, the one who, um, she went back, the, who, who found Mackenzie, 
before oh, they uh, Karen, uh, Karen Service. Yeah, yeah, parents, thank you, right. Karen Service. How they, <clears throat> how Ellen and Robbie hadn't got the memo that now Team Peterson loves her. Yeah, <laughs> they were, for years they, they really tried said to she's a very her. problematic witness. Yeah, right. Yeah, how did that change? Why do they love her now and they didn't love her back then? Just because the timeline changes so much? Is that? Yeah, it's, you know, there's always something changing. And it's it's been a while that I've looked into Karen service. I think that was one of the um, the earliest ones that we had on, on the blog was actually the whole <laughs> debacle with Russell Grable, the, the mailman who um, apparently has an... Um, uh, a photographic memory of all the houses in the neighborhood. And then you have um, Karen uh, Service, who um, I think she she was also on the, the Mod B in an interview. That's where I took most of that from. So um, she, she had a clear receipt that showed when exactly um, she... she would have gone back to close the gates and what time frame all of that that happened in that Scott left. We know the 1008 time frame. And she um, at first gave a 1030 timeline and then that was later corroborated by uh, the stamp on the receipt being 1018. Um, and it just it, it keeps going back and forth. It's just like with the Martha and, and Frank Aguilar sighting and the 930 and it's 1045, 930 to uh, 11 a.m. and you can't keep track of any of what they're saying anymore. Same with the witnesses. It was three. It was 11. It was 14. It was 500. 3,000. Everyone saw her. No one saw her. You can't keep track of all of the stuff that they're saying, frankly. So Karen Service was a completely innocent victim caught up in the storm here. She was attacked for for years online and mocked, and it's it's just really unfair what happened to her and then of course how did that end suddenly it's like oh we welcome you with open arms because we changed the timeline yet again and now you're actually helping us so it's ridiculous just before you go i'm going to ask you the question that i get asked so often you write about serial killers on, on your blog mm -hmm. danny rollings um ted bundy why do you think women like true crime? Or do you think that there's not a disproportionate amount of women? Do you think that that has been overstated? Or why do you think women like true crime so much? I think women like true crime so much because they're mostly the victims of true crimes, right? Um, this is a way for us to prepare ourselves and try to spot things like red flags. I mean, most people have at least at, at, at some point in their lives had some kind of a bad relationship. It doesn't have to have been super abusive or physically abusive, but just something where they thought I could have done better, right? And um, that plays into it. Also, I mean, ask yourself, do you feel comfortable walking out um, alone in the dark? You probably don't, even if you know it's a relatively safe neighborhood, but you know, things that can happen to you. So we're, we're looking at all of these crimes to try and see, you know, what else can we do to stay safe, to keep safe. And of course, a little part of that is it's basically campfire stories. I mean, we all have always loved horror stories in the dark, campfire stories. Um, you like to sometimes get a little scared and um, live a little bit, something like an adventure through other people's stories, even though that's very macabre, because of course, in this case, the horror stories are real and they happened and are happening to real people. But I think that's mostly the, the two main things. Uh, Aaron Banks, where can people find you? Well, um, you can find me on Crime Piper. It's a WordPress blog. Um, I'm also Ann Banks writer uh, on Facebook. Uh, where I sometimes blog about my books and my different exploits. And uh, just go to Crime Piper's social uh, media to the link, and there you can see us. You know, we're on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, what have you. Erin Banks, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I had so much fun with you. <laughs> have a great weekend, everybody. Don't forget to uh, like this video, subscribe. 
Uh, write me a five-star review because I'm sure the, the pro Peterson people will be <laughs> blasting off. On my oh, yeah. I'm looking forward iTunes. to more one-star reviews. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to be typing it as we speak. I really appreciate all the help uh, I can get. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Have a great week.